you know, there's a whole phrase, uh, knowledge is power. That's been around a thousand years, knowledge is power. I want to rephrase it more personal in our world today is a lack of knowledge is a lack of power. And what mm -hmm. we don't know about how we work that has disempowered us from taking control <laughs> of how we work. Uh, right. And the, the idea of taking control, let me, let me emphasize something very clear to begin with. Quantum physics as a, as a science is perhaps the most valid of all sciences because the theoretical ideas have almost all been materialized in the research. And I go, so what's important? I go, primary number one principle, ready? consciousness is creating our life experiences. I go, what does that mean? I said, we are creators. That's quantum physics. Uh, and, and the idea about that, then I look at people and I go, well, how's your creation going here? <laughs> you know, and it's like, it was not really going very well. I said, but you're the creator. And it's like, well, no, I feel like the victim. And I go, lack of knowledge is a lack of power. That's where it comes mm. So, should I talk about the programming? I think that might be yes, helpful. Yes, please. Right yes. It's a very simple understanding because the brain is an information processor, a computer. It's exactly what it is. And now that we have so much familiarity with the uh, silicon-based computer, this carbon-based computer in here has the same fundamental mechanisms. They both use the same thing. So let's go back in the old days, for example, when um, uh, before they put programs in your computer, you could go buy a brand new computer, come home, push start, boots up, screen lights up. I say, now do something. And you go, can't do anything. I say, got a brand new computer. Go, Not until I put programs in the computer can I use the computer. Mm -hmm. Right. So the idea is in the last trimester of pregnancy, a fetus brain lights up, screens on but it can't do anything until programs come in. And so the first seven years of a child's life, the brain is functioning at a vibration. And let me just emphasize vibration because what is that? Uh, you put wires on a person's head, it's called electroencephalograph and you can read brain function, but the functions are in vibrational frequencies, okay? Uh, the lowest frequency is delta, that's sleep. The highest frequency, well, it's called gamma, that's peak performance. Uh, and then one that we're almost always in is beta, which is thinking, schoolroom, focused consciousness. When you go home at night from that beta thinking process, you relax, then the vibrations even slow down a bit more. And then you're in alpha, which is calm consciousness. And then the moment you fall asleep, the moment you just lost it, you're gone. Your brain is in now a lower vibration called theta. Well, a child's life is in theta for the first seven years. I go, so what does it represent? Theta is hypnosis. Mm. I go, why, why should the child's brain be in hypnosis? And the answer is, that's how it got programs. Uh, you know, there's, uh, it just observes. Watch your father, watch your mother, watch your family, community. You're observing them like a video recorder. And whatever behavior they're experiencing, you are downloading that kind of behavior. Why? You want to be a member of the family and community. You got to follow the rules. And so what are the rules? Observe them, download them. Unfortunately, there's no uh, filter device, meaning good stuff gets downloaded, bad stuff gets downloaded. There's right. no filter to say good or bad. It's all getting downloaded, okay? So I say, why are we downloading these behaviors? And the answer is you need the fundamental behaviors to be the member of a family in the community, and these are programs. And you copy people. And I go, well, okay, so your subconscious is like a hard drive in a computer. It's got programs in it. And uh, the subconscious is strictly that. And a lot of people think, oh, well, that's the evil comes from subconscious. And I go, subconscious is a hard drive just like in your computer. Is your computer hard drive evil? <laughs> you know, it's no, it's yeah. a device. The it's just receiving information. Yeah. yeah, but it's the programs you put in there could be good or bad. That's So I'll give you a good program. Uh, when did you learn how to walk? Before you were two years old. Mm -hmm. I say, for most people, they can be 102 years old, they're still walking, same program. So those right. programs that come in are pretty fundamental. They can carry us all the way through life. Now, of course, since I said it's not filtered, about 60% of the downloaded programs, behaviors that are in that subconscious are uh, disempowering or self-sabotaging or limiting beliefs we acquired from other people. Did you say 60%? 60, which is more than why, 50. Why, why, is, why is there so many limiting uh, programs 
Why, why does that happen? Why don't we have 90% you know, uh, positive programs? Because the programming came from people who know that's how you take power of people. If I program mm -hmm. you, I have power over you, okay? And the first powers came from simply this. Humans are the only organism that know that they're going to die. No other organism knows it's going to die. Well, this is a stress. <laughs> like, oh, my God, my life will end. Ah, you know, and that freaks out a lot of people. And that whole thing is then the fear of dying. And fear is when you look for somebody to help you get over the fear. You don't if you're in fear, you don't look for yourself. <laughs> you're the one that's the, the victim, more or less. And you're right. looking for somebody to help. I feel like a lot of people are overwhelmed, stressed, and anxious and are in fear based around the topic of money. They don't understand 100%. it. They don't have enough of it. They don't know how to manage it. They don't want to lose it. They, yeah. You know, all these different fears. What do you think are the core differences, different beliefs between someone who is wealthy or in an abundance with money versus someone who is financially poor and struggling with money? This is the, the whole subject of a very important book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And it goes back to everything I said. It's the programming in the first seven years of your life that you're going to run that life from. The program is observing other people. If your father was well off and well to do, then you unconsciously downloaded the behavior to manifest what he was manifesting. But if you come from a poor family and all you talk about is struggle and we can't get there, and that means most of us do have a concern about what if I don't have the money? You know, I can't get health care. I can't get food. I can't, where am I going to sleep? I, homeless people, where do they come from? You know? Uh, and so the significance about all this is if you're concerned about the money, you're concerned about the fact that your programming said you're not successful, that you're not going to make it. This is a rat race. That's Darwinian theory, which has screwed us big time because it's false. And it was based on Darwinian theory. It's a struggle for survival based on competition, winner, loser competition, you know. And I so said, that is completely not the drive force of evolution. It's actually the 180 degrees opposite drive force. Uh, give a simple point. A garden is not a battleground. By definition, a garden is everybody's cooperating. Then we come into the garden, evolve, and then guess what? We turned it into a battleground. And guess what? <laughs> now we're facing an extinction because we're destroying the ecosystem that provides for us. So uh, the point was this. Battleground was never built into the system. It was acquired. People seeking power over each other, uh, you know, and, and it started with force. The first power is force. <laughs> you don't want it my way? Now you do it my way. And, uh, and that was the first power that came in. And, and people are living under a misbelief that life is a struggle. And if they don't go out there in that rat race and compete like all the other rats out there, they're mm -hmm. going to not make it. So guess what? Everybody's right. out on a you know competition bent. And the unfortunate part, here's a sports person, sir. The definition of competition is not the one we're using today. That's an inaccurate definition. The way we look at competition, that's a winner-loser conflict. You know, whether it's two sports team, winner-loser, whatever it is. Okay? But no, the original definition of competition, to strive together. Mm, really? What does that mean? It says you want to be a tennis player? Don't play the weaker person. You're not going to learn anything from him. Play the, the more powerful person. Why? It's a competition, but what was the point? I'll do better if I learn by playing from the, the better player than if I learn from the weaker player. Right. So that kind of competition isn't win or loser. Both people win. The guy who's better won the game. The other guy wins. Why? Now I got better you know, technique. So uh, we live in a win or loser competition, which is uh, leads to violence and struggle and war and all that other like that. What would be the new script to reprogram and... And how effective would it be for someone to do this right before they go to sleep with the new script? Well, any, yeah, anything that you put in your mind consciously before you go to sleep is still lingering in there as you go to sleep. So it's like fomenting <laughs> inside. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the, the, I think that the very first thing is this. Even before the money, I said, what was the first one? I said, you have to love yourself because that means you will take care of yourself. 
and people don't love themselves, they don't take care of themselves. And you know that you've seen people yeah. physiologically fall apart in front of your face because they don't take care of themselves. Why they, they make poor choices with their nutrition or working out or everything's habits. not relevant. Yeah. But if they have a pet, oh man, my pet's going to get the best food. My pet's going to get the best health care. I'm going to, you know, take care of this pet. Do they take care of themselves? Not as good as they take care of the pet <laughs> right away. There's your problem. So number one is first identify you love yourself because then everything you do after that will be supporting your love. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. Then deservability. I do not deserve. Why? Well, that's what I was programmed. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not wealthy enough. I'm not beautiful enough, whatever. I go, well, you better start programming. I deserve X. I deserve Y. Okay. Not I will deserve. I deserve. <laughs> right. Uh, again, I just want to emphasize that because any futurism in a subconscious mind doesn't work because subconscious doesn't see future. It just sees the moment. Mm -hmm. So if you record, I will be wealthy, I will be healthy. Uh, I say, when's that going to happen? I go, well, put it in the record. We'll come back next year, Lewis, and let's push the button and says, I will be healthy. And I go, you're still not there. Yeah. <laughs> can't get there because I never said you were there. You're, you're only in a want. <laughs> you can't get there. So the idea is that's why everything but go back to, it has to be in the present tense. I am healthy. I am wealthy. I am this, and I am lovable you know, so that's really important. That's if, if you don't do that right, then, but you can always reprogram. That's the beautiful part. I, oh, sure. I put it up. Well then reprogram it again. You can do yeah. it. How important is it for people to learn to heal the past then so that they can love themselves in the now as opposed uh, how, to be taught oh, to heal the past. Yes. You will automatically start doing that when you start loving yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and let me give you something because I had to learn a lot, a lot, you know, I learned some rules I, you know, I had all these principles, then I had to walk the talk and I learned some rules. One of the, one of the most important rules is, is to let go of, I'm a spiritual person, but religion is somebody making up rules for you. <laughs> I go, no, we, we are directly connected with source. There, nobody's going to interfere with that. Okay. So, but, but it was really important to, to uh, uh, recognize this character for a very important reason, because it says you are more than this right here. Mm -hmm. This is a, this is, I, I call this a, um, uh, the, the television set. In other words, I'm receiving a broadcast, the Bruce broadcast. Bruce is not in here. That's what I learned in my cells. It's like, oh my God. We're not in here. We're receiving a broadcast because on the surface of your cells, there are antennas called receptors. I said, well, you got receptors. So they were on the surface. What? Eyes, ears, nose, taste, touch. They read the environment. Receptors read the environment. Okay. Well, there's a unique set of receptors that each individual has and no two people have the same set of these receptors. And they're called, interesting enough, self-receptors. Uh, and so uh, each person has a set of antennas, but they're different. No two people share the same set. So when you put your cells or an organ into another person's body, their immune system will look at those antennas and go, no, that, that's not us. And then eliminate those cells. That's what the immune system will do. Okay. Well, I'm into all this stuff and the receptors and how it's all working. And then all of a sudden I realize, well, wait a minute. The difference between us is just a set of receptors if we I look at your liver cell, I look at my liver cell, I go 99%. They're doing exactly the same thing. But you have Lewis receptors, I have Bruce receptors. I say, but the receptors are antennas. I say, yeah, and they're on the outside of the cell surface. I go, then where do you think the signal is coming from to go to these receptors? Not inside, outside. I said, oh, holy, each of us is receiving a different broadcast, a frequency somewhere in the environment. Uh, and, and, and in the quantum physics term, we talk about energy fields. That's what they talk about. In spiritual terms, we talk about spirit, which is what? An energy field. That each of us has our own energy field. Well, the, that was the moment of transition in my life. Mm. First thing I said is, oh my God, I'm not in here. I'm the broadcast <laughs> that's being picked up here. I'm not in here. This is 
That's where the analogy, this is a TV set that you're watching, Lewis, is playing the Bruce show right now. Yes. And when you're watching a TV and it breaks, we say TV is dead. I go, yeah, it's not working anymore. Question, <laughs> is the broadcast still there after the TV is broken? The answer, of course it is. How do you know? I said, get another TV, tune it to the station. You're back on again. I go, exactly. We are not in here. We are receiving a broadcast that no mm. two people get the same broadcast. And I go, and what about that? And I go, the broadcast is here whether you're here or not. Uh, and, and then all of a sudden, I, because uh, I wasn't spiritual. Zero. How much? Zero. Bruce had zero spiritual until he saw this. And then he said, oh, my God, my identity is not built in. My identity is a broadcast. That means if my television breaks, my television's dead, but my broadcast is still there. Mm -hmm. And it could be picked up by another embryo with the same set of antennas if it shows up and I'm back. And all of a sudden, it's like all this mystical stuff started going, oh, my God, this is real. <laughs> this is totally real. And the most important thing, I lost the fear of death instantly. Mm -hmm. I just said, I'm not, a, this is not a, a, a believe in spirituality. This is a mechanism of spirituality. I go, therefore, if I die, I'm still here as a spirit, you know, and it's like the fear of death, which is the number one fear we started with, number one fear that all people have because only humans know they're going to die. And then we bought religion stories and paid for these stories. And they told you what you can do and what you can't do. And it's a bunch of, actually, there are good things to learn, but they're also there. They mm. take away your power. They give you something and they also take away your power. And, and then came to me, the big story, and all of a sudden, when I realized, oh, my God, I'm a broadcast and a television set. And I said to myself, why have a body? Why not just be the spirit? My cells come up with a question. You ready? If you're just a spirit, Bruce, what does chocolate taste like? Mm -hmm. That's so deep. You have to I'll give you another five minutes to put that one in there. <laughs> and, down with it. and the reason is this our perceptions of our physical experiences, mm -hmm. you know, anything from sight, smell, sound, touch, taste, love is a feeling, that's physiology. The body is translating the environment into sensations which are broadcast back to source. So I came here to experience. I go, yeah, but I also came here because I can move around and create. And then all of a sudden, the big one, Boom, hit me right in the head there, Lewis. I said, what was it? I said, oh, my God, people think you die and go to heaven. I go, no, you were born into heaven. Why? Mm. What's your vision of heaven? Well, here it is. You're the creator. Manifest it. Oh, my God, we can manifest heaven. I go, people fall in love. They all of a sudden feel, yeah, that's heaven. That was really great. <laughs> I go, well, you manifested that. And all of a sudden, I realized, oh, my God. People are so lost thinking, well, if I just be okay, I'll have heaven when I'm dead. And I'm going, no, I think you missed it, folks. <laughs> this is heaven. If you understand how to get out of the program, then you become the manifester of the program. Then heaven is a way of life right here, right now for all of us. When we grow up, and it's especially important uh, in regard to health, most people, I just say most families, when somebody's sick, they, take, they go to the doctor. Okay, I go, great. So you're a kid, you see mommy go to the doctor, daddy goes to the doctor, and then you go to the doctor. I say, why are you going to the doctor? And the answer is, it's about your health. I say, yeah, but what's the point? You ready? You don't know anything about your health, but they do. Right. So all of a sudden, you seek their advice. And I go, well, then their words become your truth because you have no other truth but what they said. And all of a sudden, then you become a victim uh, in your biology, according to the program, because the program said your life is controlled by genes. I go, so what does that mean? I go, well, as far as I know, I didn't pick them and I can't change them if I don't like the character. And they turn on and off by themselves. Victim, what? Heredity. I, I got genes. It's not my life. It's my genes. And then right. If my if my grandparents had a heart attack, then I'm susceptible to this and, and, and onward and onward. Exactly. And cancer. You know, it's like, oh, I got cancer running in the family. Oh, there must be genes. And then the genes. And would I get that gene? I'm going to get cancer. Then I'm the victim. And the fear <laughs> goes on and on and on, uh, except for an interesting fact. There is no gene that causes cancer. 
let's say the, the especially for women, they're very much uh, concerned about the breast cancer gene, BRCA gene. The only thing is, 50% of the women that have the breast cancer gene never get cancer. Mm. I say, so what's the meaning of that? I say, possession of the gene doesn't cause cancer. It's the, right. the lifestyle that's in disharmony that causes the cancer. The gene just supported it. And now we know 90% of cancer comes from people who have no cancer in their family. Interesting. So, well, then where'd the cancer come from? Lifestyle is manifesting cancer. And you can change your consciousness and you can change cancer. But uh, people believe they're victims. And, uh, and right. if you believe you're a victim, you give up your power. Remember that victim means mm. I have no power. And then I say, well, who has power? Well, over my spirit, the church has the power. And they tell me what to do. Over my health, the medical doctor has the power. They tell me what to do. And my life becomes shaped by those opinions. They're not even mine. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, and this is the point. It's like, well, when do you think you're going to become powerful? And I go, well, how about when you find out you are a spirit and you can never be disconnected from source? Nobody can disconnect you from source. There's no such thing as hell, <laughs> you right. know, and health. Uh, what do they know? In fact, in the United States, the third leading cause of death in the United States is called iatrogenic illness. First is heart disease, second is cancer, and third is a uh, result of medical treatment, iatrogenic illness. Interesting. What's the percentage of people that you think live in victimhood? In I'd have to say 90% or more. Really? At every level, I'm a victim of what? Well, my job. If I don't do what they said, then uh, I lose my job. I don't have a job. I don't have any money. I don't have any health care. I don't have any money. And all of a sudden, you start to realize, well, then where do I get the money? And then you bet, well, you better start conforming to whoever's going to give you the money. Yeah, at some point, uh, you're not living your life. You're living the program that you think you need to do to fit into the picture. And, and if you live the program, it's almost all disempowerment. I can't do this. Right. This won't happen. I can't, you know, whatever. I'm a victim. And, sure. and, and victims, by just saying that, the word is powerless. Victim and powerless, same word. Right. And, and what do you think the differences are then between the, the conscious and the subconscious mind? And I know well, you've mentioned that's, that. That's the game. That's the most important whole question you just asked there right now, Lewis, for this reason. The subconscious, I said, is the equivalent of a hard drive on a computer. It can run the show. You push start, it could do things. You don't have to even attend to it. It does it by itself. The conscious mind is the equivalent of who's typing on the keyboard because you're the one that's putting information into this thing. The mm -hmm. conscious mind, uh, and here's the important part. Let's just start with this. The mind is controlling our biology. That's a fact. Now I go, but when you say the mind, it sounds like, oh, there's one mind. I go, now that is where it goes wrong because there are two minds and they, they both have different functions. And most importantly, they learn in different ways. What are the two minds? Well, let's start with the latest evolution. Right behind your forehead is a lump of brain called prefrontal cortex, the seat of self-consciousness. I am uh -huh. an individual. I am separate from all other individuals. I am a self and I'm, a, you know, coming from this creative part. Uh, the subconscious mind, as we mentioned, that's just the hard drive with programs in it. So I say, so what's the difference between it? Well, the first thing is this. What makes humans so different than other organisms is the self-conscious or conscious mind because it's creative. It has imagination. I could ask you right now, Lewis, I could tell you, I could ask you a question. I say, Tell me what you want out of your life. Well, at that moment, you're going to think and you're going to say, you know, I want this and I, I want that. And I go, well, that came from the conscious mind. Now it's creative. That has imagination. That has vision. And if you have a, a, a vision, you can then manifest a vision. If you, for, mm. you can't manifest a vision if you don't have a vision. <laughs> so conscious mind sets up visions and what we want. But here's the point. Um, and th this is the, the critical, the whole thing is on this one part right now, Lois, right here, and that is this. The conscious mind, which is the creative mind, versus subconscious mind, which is the habit mind. It does habits. as does It's program. Program's a habit. Push the button, play the program, push the button, play it again, push it, play it again. Okay, program. Conscious mind creator, okay? And I go, okay, significance of that is that's where your wishes and desires are. 
what do you want? Oh man, I want this. I want a great relationship. I want a great job. I want great health. You know, you're creative. The subconscious mind programs primarily derived from other people before age seven, okay? And unfiltered, so there are good programs and there are bad programs, okay? Uh, and I go, so creative conscious mind is the one that gives you a destination and a future. Subconscious mm -hmm. mind just gives you autopilot. Okay, back to the crux of the problem. Only 5% of the day is the conscious mind actually engaged in creating. And I go, then what's it doing 95? I get 95% <laughs> of the day, it's thinking. I go, so what does that mean? I go, imagine your body's a vehicle, steering wheel, conscious is holding a wheel and driving us to where? Wishes and desires, man. Okay. And I say, but if I start thinking, then conscious mind's no longer looking out because thinking is inside. It's a mm -hmm. thought on the inside. I said, well, if you're thinking, then conscious mind is not looking out. I go, well, what if you're driving the car and then you start thinking? I go, conscious mind, let go of the wheel. I said, oh my God. I go, no, don't worry, why? Subconscious mind is autopilot. Whatever you're not controlling with your conscious mind, subconscious mind throws a program in and does it, okay? Mm. Now, the issue about that is, well, if the conscious mind is thinking, is it observing what's going on? I go, no, to observe what's going on, it has to look out the window, can't be looking inside. So 95% of the day, it doesn't even observe your own behavior. I said, but where's that behavior coming from? I go, the program. I go, well, yeah, but where did that come from? I go, somebody else. And I go, what's relevant? Well, if they didn't put your wishes and desires into their life, then you copy their program. You're, you're not going toward your wishes and desires, you're going to wherever the their program is going to. That's how children follow in the footpath of their parents, mm. especially like musicians. A, a musician who is a parent uh, during the programming of their own child instills them with all the music and stuff like that. Then a child grows up and guess what? Now they're a musician. People say, the music gene. I go, there's no music gene. There was training <laughs> for seven years, training to be that. So the issue is, 95% of our life is not coming from wishes and desires. It's coming from programs, which came from other people. And you don't see it when it's happening. And I go, why not? And I said, why are you playing a program? Because I'm not paying attention. I go, well, that's yeah. why you don't see the program. And I go, and then 95% of your life is program. And then the relevance about that is 60% of those are, are <laughs> disempowering or self-sabotaging or limiting beliefs. So it says, then 95% of the day you're running your life and you're the only one that doesn't see it. I go, well, that's the big issue. I go, the same story for 40 years. that has been in all my videos, but I got to do it again because different audience here. Yeah. You have a friend, you know, your friend's behavior very, very well. You're really, you know, good friends. And you happen to know your friend's parent. And one day you see your friend has the same behavior as their parents. So, you know, you got to tell, you got to hey, Bill, you're just like your dad back away from Bill. I know exactly what Bill's going to say all the time. Bill's going to say, how can you compare me to my dad? I'm nothing like my dad. The audience laughs. Why? They're familiar with it. I go, that, you want the profound story of the day? That's the profound story. I go, what does it mean? Everybody else can see that Bill behaves like his dad. The only one who can't see it is Bill. Explain it simple. Yeah. Bill downloaded these programs from his dad. Yep. When does he play him? When he's thinking. And I say, and how much of that? I say, 95% of the day. I say, does he see the program? I say, no, thinking is inside. He's not looking out. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so Bill's the only one that doesn't see it. And he got it from somebody else. And so it's not his behavior. And he could be sabotaging himself. And he's the only one that can't see it. Because why? Because he's thinking. And I go, okay, you ready? All of us are Bill. You're the creator. Mm. Didn't see what you were creating with. And when we get personal awareness of this, then personal empowerment is the next step. Because now it's like, well, if I'm doing this, then I'm the one that can change it. And I go, absolutely. Absolutely. That's what the whole point is. Uh, and this is why you're, you know, all your programs, Lewis, are so involved with wake up, people. It's time to take the power back and become what you want to be in this life because you don't realize you're playing programs that are sabotaging you all day long and you yes. don't see it. You're the only one. 
And right. so that's the, the big wake up call. So it says, well, what can I do? And I say, well, A, you could just not play the program. And I go, well, that's not easy to do. That means you can't think. <laughs> right. And thinking is so fundamental, everything. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to say, I will stay mindful. That means I will not think. I will stay here in the present mind and pay attention to what's going on. I go, mm -hmm. great, but it's very difficult to do that. So I say, well, if you're not going to stay mindful, then what else can I do? I say, well, then change the program. And if you change the program, then 95% of the day, if you put a program that's your wishes and your desires, mm -hmm. then 95% of the day, you will be manifesting that when the program is running, wow. and plus an additional 5% when your conscious mind is running it. So that would be 100% of the day you would be moving toward wishes and desires. But you have to look at the program. That's why we announced. I say, what's the program? Look at your life. What do you want to change? What's not working for you? So can you give me an example of maybe you've worked with a lot of people in the last, you know, many decades who have probably a lot of the same limiting thoughts, limiting beliefs that hold them back. That's what culture is. <laughs> right. What are the main limiting beliefs that you just hear consistently that most people tend to have if they're not in a heavy, a, a higher level program that they've caught and switched with? Well, one of the main beliefs that they're caught up in is the uh, lack of power they feel over their own health and their own reality. That I'm a victim. I'm a victim of my genes. I'm a victim of this world out here. I say if you, if a, <laughs> the belief system uh, is translated into behavior, <laughs> if I believe I'm a victim, then my behavior will be as a victim. No power. You guys tell me what to do, and I'll try and do what you just said. And I say, well, that's the biggest problem of all, because quantum physics, I mentioned, is the most valid science. And principle number one is you're the creator of this. And it's like, well, when are you going to own that? And the answer is, I could say it, but then you walk away. And a few minutes later, you're back into your world again. Everything is gone. You know, listen, it took me a while. Uh, I learned and understood that, oh, my God, this is how it works. And I was so excited. I wanted to get people. I wanted to tell anybody to listen to the science. <laughs> this is how it works. So I, I beginning got some people together and I started to go off. Let me tell you how to create the most beautiful life experience. And then they'd look at me and they go, you know, Lipton, for a guy who says, you know, this, your, your life doesn't look that good. Interesting. It was my wake up call that said, how the hell can I talk about how wonderful this is? And I'm not practicing it. And I immediately said to myself, no, don't go out there and talk to anybody about this. Why? Until you do it. So what were the, what were the things that were holding you back before you discovered this? And then what was the new program that you started to implement for yourself on a consistent basis to have a hundred percent upgraded program? Yeah. Well, uh, one of the things professionally, okay. I was doing a great job. I, I had a great professorship in a medical school, all that kind of stuff. For, you know, personally, my life sucked. <laughs> really? I get a relationship off the ground. I go, why not? And I go, well, now that I know about it, I was programmed about relationships by observing my father and my mother. Well, they had dysfunctional relationships. So what do you think I downloaded? Dysfunction. Yeah. So my conscious mind goes forward and says, yeah, I want to have a great relationship. I get into it. My subconscious mind steps up and says, oh, this is how we do a relationship. You, Ooh, uh oh, <laughs> game over. Right. You know why? Because I didn't see the negative behaviors that I was putting out. My partner, potential partner saw them and gave them cause for alarm. I don't think I want to be with this guy. You know, that was me. <laughs> uh, and then I realized that. And that's when I really had to go in first thing and start to change. Who am I? And I'll tell you the biggest problem uh, now after years of working, people do not love themselves. Mm. And I say, what does that mean? I say, if you have a program where you don't love yourself, then rationally, logically, can anybody else love you? And the answer no. is no. Because you don't think you're lovable. That's right. And somebody says you are that, oh, I love you. And then you go, well, you know, you probably don't have any quality control. I know I'm not lovable. What's wrong with you? You know, <laughs> and then at some point you push them away and then they're not there. And then you go, I'm not lovable. Nobody's here. <laughs> I, I push them away, you know, and I changed that. I was nearly what, 45 years old, 40 some years mm. old. And I had zero 
quality relationships for all that life. Right. I've changed the program. And within a couple of years, I, I'm now with my partner, Margaret. Uh, and, and the fact is, she was involved with a um, workshop training program for people. So she understood processing and stuff. And when I came and we added the science and the processing, uh, we've been living a honeymoon for 26 mm. years. Really? 26 years waking up every day going, wow, still here. Another day for fun. Another day for being in love. It was great. And it still is. But if I didn't change the program, that would never have been part of my life at all. I would have been my whole life struggling. How did you change it? And what was the thing that you started to say in replace of the previous program? Well, the first thing was I had, we do muscle testing. Now you're an athlete, all that stuff. And you know about muscles. Well, let me just say about muscle testing. The conscious mind is a creative mind. But, and the subconscious mind is a program, but the subconscious mind being a massive processor controls muscles, the subconscious, not thinking, man, it's boom. It's just programmed real fast reflexes. Boom. Like this. Okay. So <clears throat> if you make a statement with your conscious mind, the creative mind and the subconscious mind doesn't agree with that. There's no history to support that statement. Then the two minds are not in harmony. I say, what happens when they're in disharmony? The answer is it weakens the subconscious mind wow. and the muscles get weaker. So, so how, do we, how do we get them in harmony? Well, you have to make sure then whatever statements you're making are agree with the subconscious program. And if you want a statement that's positive and your subconscious program doesn't have it, then all of a sudden you say, well, that's where I got, I got to fix the subconscious mind. I don't need to fix a conscious one. And that's when it comes back. Well, then programming that subconscious mind. Another one that was so amazing was uh, I tried to write my biology belief book. I got to three different times. I got started, got about halfway through, and it just petered out. I just, mm. just disappeared. And I, and I was so upset because I really wanted to write this book. And then doing muscle testing, I, I found out that my subconscious mind did not support writing the book. I go, why not? And the answer was because I'm a scientist. And if I wrote the book, which had spirituality in it, I would lose my support from my colleagues. So my subconscious mind was saying, okay, that's enough. That, no more writing, because if you conclude this, you're going to be an outcast from your society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I remember uh, doing a, one of these balances, they're called 15 minutes or less. And in the process, uh, uh, part of the balance was how do I want this book to be written now? Well, I said, I want it to be written fast because I wasted a lot of time. <laughs> and I thought struggling over it was a pain. In the so uh, I thought, you know, um, maybe it should be fun. <laughs> okay. And, uh, uh, and so but fun and easy, uh, uh, whatever it was, I balanced that. And I forgot about it because it was just 15 minutes. And it was like, oh, yeah, I should do something about that, blah, blah, blah. And months later, the book is done. Wow. And I remember uh, getting reviewing it. It's going to go to the publisher. This is the final read, sending it to the publisher, get down to the last page, down to the last thing, get down to the last line. It's finished. And I pushed myself back in the chair and I said, wow, that was fast and kind of fun and it was easy. I said, holy, those are the words that I put in, which I completely forgot about. And I programmed my mind that way. And the moment I finished the book, I said, fast, fun, and easy. I go, holy, that's what, that was the program. Mm. Uh, uh, and it was what took me off. And, uh, and, but I go back to the, I love myself one, because uh, I can tell you now for a fact, uh, and being involved with so many belief change programs, why so many marriages fall apart, because Mm. They never really connected. They were sort of like, uh, you know, on the surface, really nice, but their subconscious programs clash, boom, gone, right. it's not working. Uh, and, and then the idea is what? Well, let me give you a reason why. You're an athlete, so I know I can tell you right, right where the, that programming worked. And it goes like this. Um, if a kid on a sports team is not doing well, the coach doesn't go, oh, please try harder. You could do better. I go, no, coach comes out there. That's not good enough. Who do you think you are? You know, you're not worthy to be on this team, blah, blah, blah. And the player immediately in the conscious mind goes, oh, my God, I, I better work harder and be better. And great. Now I say, what if the parent 
is acting as a coach and the kid is five years old. I go, why is that important? I said, they're not using the conscious mind at five years old. They're in record. And the parent said, that's not good enough. You don't deserve this. You're not lovable. Who do you think you are? I say, the child is not thinking about what the parent was intending. The right. child is recording. I'm not lovable. I'm not deserving. I'm not. This. And I go, the 95% of your life is going to come from that program. And you see why you struggle. You don't love yourself because the first thing you'd be critical of yourself. I'm not good enough. I'm not this. I, I go, well, now you're self-critical. <laughs> and the moment you're self-critical, you just uh, cancel the whole game right at that point. So what is this? muscle balance test thing you were talking about is this called muscle you, testing how do you do this well uh one a very simple way you can use any part of your body with muscles i could push on your head i could push on a finger usually it's done with an arm my arm yeah push my arm, arm down out. and yeah. the game is this it's not arm wrestling people think oh i say no no the idea is this you have to keep focus you, you make a statement and you keep your mind on that statement uh, difference. Give me, give me an example. Give me an example of like, uh, I love, I love myself. myself. I love myself. Okay. Hold out yeah. your arm point. If the conscious and subconscious agree, the muscle is a rock. You could do chin ups on that arm. Okay. But if the subconscious doesn't agree with the conscious mind, you say I'm lovable and the subconscious mind will give you all the reasons why you're not. Mm. And guess what? Now the two minds are in disharmony and now the, the arm will move. I say, well, how much does it move? I say, well, all you need to know is that, it moved that much. If it just moved that a little much, bit, any yeah. more pushing or thing, now that's arm wrestling. It was, if if they both agree, that's solid. That's not even going to move. But if there's, if the two don't agree, then just even the first downward movement like that says, that's it, that you don't have to do any more. So how do you program then with knowing this information? You said it was like a 15 minute thing you did yeah, to, okay. to program. Okay. Well, let me, let me just say there are three ways to program. So there's there's not just one. The, the, the one I'm going to tell you is the fast. It's okay. The, it's a miracle one. Okay. I'm going to say, well, how'd you, what are the other ways of programming a habit? And I say, well, how'd you get the habit? Because you were in hypnosis for seven years. And I say, how do you get into hypnosis? I say, well, guess what? Uh, remember when you're at work, you have higher vibration. Then you come home, the vibration calms down, mm -hmm. alpha. And then the moment you fall asleep, you are in a vibration called theta, which is hypnosis. So putting earphones on at night with a program of what you want to be true in your life and just put it, you're sleeping and the program is talking to your subconscious and it's only a short window. So you repeat this a lot, just put the programs. On. And then one day you wake up and the program is already manifested. Okay. So that's right. hypnosis. It's called self-hypnosis. Okay. Second way, you still learn things after you were seven years old driving a car, playing an instrument, you know, uh, sports, whatever you learned then, okay? I go, well, how'd you learn that? Because it became a habit. I say, repetition, practice. That's what makes a habit after age right. seven. Anything you want, then you've got to practice it uh, and you can manifest it, okay? The third way is the one we were just talking about, and that's a new form of psychology called energy psychology. I go, what does that mean? I go, Maybe you've seen somebody uh, read a book. It's called super learning. You know, they, they can open up a book to a page and they can take their finger and go down the page and they read everything just as fast as I, I went like that. I read every word on the page. That's called super learning. I go, these techniques, energy, psychology, engage super learning. I say, so what's relevant? The earphones on at night, the repetition, time consuming repetition. You got to do them both. Energy psychology, 15 minutes in a super learning state mm. will download a behavior in 15 minutes. You walk away, it's totally different. Just boom, just as fast as that. Uh, and it sounds, oh, that's a new agey monkey. I go, no, no, <laughs> this, is, this is real. I go, because since then, and I've been involved with it, uh, uh, um, a neuroscientist, uh, uh, Jeff Fannin, uh, he was in his lab doing neuroscience stuff, brain mapping. That's what they called it. Someone in his uh, uh, lab who worked there went through a what's the energy psychology process, the one I'm talking about, psyche, came back to the lab and told Jeff, you know, you can change your beliefs in so many minutes. He says, no, you can't. I'm a neuroscientist. I know you can't do that. So they argue back and forth, but they're in the lab. So Jeff said, here, put the electrode caps, the EEG cap, put it on my head. Do you, you do that process. His whole life changed five minutes later. His whole really? life went upside down because it was on the screen now. It's not new age. 
it showed the brain all of a sudden became what is called whole brain function, whole brain lit up. And he said, he's only seen that on some master meditators. The only time you've ever seen that. And he saw it and it is so powerful. It's recordable. That's the cool part. So it's not like, Oh, that's a good idea. I say, no, here it is. Uh, the machine will show it. A uh, matter of fact, it's so obvious that EEGs are just like squiggly lines, squiggly lines going across like that. Audience can't read them. Neuro people do, but he, started giving some lectures where he'd have somebody come up who wanted to change a belief and they put the cap on in front of the audience, but they then put it on the big screen, the electrical readout of the EEG. Then they would do this, what's called the psyche balance. And the audience would go, oh. they could, it was so profoundly different that, oh my God, the whole brain pattern just changed in front of everybody's face, completely just doing the process. So I bring this up only to say, it sounds new agey, but no, there's a scientific objective measurement. Sure. Of this. Uh, and, and basically, what does it do? It engages a super learning capacity. And, and you can download just like a kid, actually, before age seven. That's when children had whole brain activity before age seven. That's how they could download stuff instantly. Just download it, download it. OK, after age seven. Uh, the whole brain, right and left hemispheres, there's a line right down the middle of the brain. They're called two hemispheres. The left hemisphere is like sees whole pictures. The right hemisphere sees pieces. OK, uh, left hemisphere sees a brick wall. Right hemisphere sees the little bricks in the wall. OK, uh, the left hemisphere is intellectual. The right hemisphere is emotional. Mm -hmm. These are complementary characters. As long as the brain is integrated, they work together. But after age seven, they separate. Mm. And then during the day, every couple of hours or so, you're in the left side. Then a few hours later, you're in the right side. I go, what's the difference? I say, Son, sometimes I'm more intellectual in my approach. And then a little bit later, I'm more emotional in my approach. 